Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. It's November 17th, 2021. And this is the wreck of the steamship Portland, rediscovering the Titanic of New England, a talk with Dr. Calvin Myers. Uh, Dr. Myers is a research associate at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and has led and worked on over 30 maritime archeology span projects around the world. He is co-founder and instructor of SEAMAHP, a training program that leverages the concept of a ship's life cycle to provide hands-on experimental learning to the public in maritime archaeology. Since 2015, he has co-directed the only maritime archaeology field schools in Massachusetts with cooperation of the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources, the Trustees of Reservations, and the National Park Service, and has run maritime archaeological summer programs for middle and high school students. He is a senior tutor for the Nautical Archaeology Society for the New England Region, a group that provides maritime archaeological training for the public. Dr. Myers has received grants from the National Park Service Maritime Heritage Program and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and has published in the International Journal of Nautical Archaeology, the Society for Historical Archaeology, and Bermuda Maritimes. He is currently involved in several projects in Massachusetts, including the archaeological investigation of the 1626 Sparrowhawk, and deep sea research on shipwrecks in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And tonight um, he joins us to talk about one of those shipwrecks of the steamship Portland. Uh, Dr. Myers, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate it and welcome to everybody who's joined and, um, and to those who will watch a little bit later. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you for coming and um, participating tonight. Very happy to have you. Okay, so um, uh, I just need to go ahead and share the screen, right? Mm -hmm, whenever you're ready. Okay. So let's... Okay, uh, that should be up and ready to go now. And I, again, want to thank everybody um, attending as we go through. Um, if you see me look over to the side, I have my notes over there. So uh, tonight, what I'd like to do is uh, briefly go over the background and history of the passenger ship Portland. Uh, some may be very familiar, some uh, might have heard of it, and maybe to a few that it's completely new. But the bulk of the time, I want to focus on uh, what we have done. I'm a maritime archaeologist, and over the course of 2019 and 2020, I participated on a series of expeditions to the Portland, among other shipwrecks, in Stowagon Bank. And then I'd like to wrap up about the connections that archaeology can make between a ship that now sits in 500 feet of water um, that very few to no one can really see in person and how it still uh, has this living memory to those uh, um, descendants of some of the victims, but also to the city. And I'm, I'm very honored. This is the first time I've done a talk to the namesake of, of Portland, uh, uh, the ship. So I really appreciate everybody coming in and I've grown uh, in my research to really enjoy my trips up there and I hope to come back pretty soon. So the steamship, uh, the paddle steamer Portland was built in 1889 and uh, was a massive undertaking, basically the size of a football field that all said and done, she uh, sits at 290 feet and is about uh, 60 feet wide. So football field long, football field wide and several decks with in the middle of it, a 30 foot walking beam, which you can see right here. These are the uh, ship construction plans and that's what made it um, go. It was connected to uh, the walking beam looks like a big seesaw that goes up and down and is connected to a crankshaft that turns the side paddle wheels. It's a side paddle wheeler. And uh, it was um, 
one of those industrial revolution marvels that made traveling between Boston and Portland and Portland back to Boston very luxurious. You could for a dollar uh, round or a dollar one way, uh, get on the ship either at Portland and travel down to Boston and enjoy a wonderful nights of entertainment, relaxation, music, food. You could rent uh, one of its berths and wake up the next morning in the city, do your business maybe for the week, hop on on Friday and go see your family or loved ones. And it was advertised as a palatial travel. So this was a night boat. And as I just got to, done describing, uh, it traveled overnight, usually leaving Port of Call at 7 p.m. and then arriving about 12 hours later, around 7 a.m. in the next morning. And it spared no expense. It um, was filled with uh, saloons, skylights, 167 cherry paneled staterooms. Uh, there was over 500 uh, berths where you could sleep. And one person, um, and I have to say, just a quick aside, I have grown uh, to meet many wonderful researchers uh, in, 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 in this process. And one of them, uh, Herb Adams, who has been an immense help uh, in, in introducing me to both Portland as well as uh, some of the resources out there. And he wrote a wonderful article in which he quotes a, uh, a child who said, or he wasn't a child at the time, but when he was a child, this uh, gentleman was on the Portland just a few days before it sank and uh, had this quote, to, to my childish eyes, the very gangplank, and, uh, gangplank to this fairy palace was a, was a premise. The grand staircases, the carpeted floors, the plush chairs, Ford saloon with the galley above, the staterooms with, their, with these interesting bunks, one smaller one, a larger beneath, and the people coming and going, all these experiences for a boy were foretaste of a sort of heaven. And you can just see in this picture what a wonderful, magical place it had to be to take this journey to step aboard a ship and then end up in a whole new world. These were very much magical opportunities, as well as places where people could go. And for a few hours, the cares of the world. Uh, were forgotten. But on November 26, and over the night into the 27th, 1898, uh, we're November 17th, so less than 10 days from now, um, approximately 120 years ago, 123 years ago, this uh, idyllic situation this journey of relaxation changed dramatically. Uh, a storm was swept up through the Northeast, um, creating havoc along the Eastern seaboard, in particular New England. 80% of all ship casualties and shipwrecks happened in this one night uh, because of the storm that later was named the Portland Gale. Captain Hollis Blanchard left Boston at 7 p.m. He was aware of incoming weather. There are all different types of theories, even conspiracies on reasons why he left. Um, at the end, it doesn't matter. He chose to outrun the storm for whatever reason that he, he did. At 11 p.m., another ship saw them trying to beat against the ever-increasing waves heading north just off Cape Ann. They repeated that they were fighting as hard as they could. After that, no, um, no message was ever received again. At some point in the night, throughout the night, and into the next morning, the ship fought against the waves, but it never reached shore. For the next day and the weeks to come, headlines around the nation reported the loss and the disaster of the Portland Gale, focusing specifically on the shipwreck Portland. The numbers and the tolls of the dead, it was a fog of war. It was confusing. Um, they would change. There was reports of those who perished on the shipwreck who were later uh, came forth and were found to be alive and never had been on the ship. And one of the challenges 
was that there was a register of passengers on board the Portland, but not at any of the ports. There was no register of passengers on Boston where they left Indian Wharf. And so no one knew for sure who was. They had to start to do detective work. And for the next week, a few weeks, bodies and carnage and artifacts washed up all over Cape Cod shores. And some of these bodies counted had um, had pocket watches. And these became clues for when the ship actually sank on November 27, 1898. Some of these passengers, as they were um, pieced together, you had a, a range of society. You had, for example, gentlemen up in the upper left, Honorable Elias Dudley Freeman of Yarmouth, Maine, who was returning home after a brief business trip to Boston. Uh, to his next picture is Miss Eunice Augustus Wheeler, who was traveling with her sister, Mrs. George O'Chickering, bound for Portland to attend a relative's funeral. She was from South Weymouth, Massachusetts. You had the Schmidt family, Jess, Jasmine, Jessine, excuse me, sons Jorgen and Antu, Anton, who had just returned from Denmark only hours before and decided to board the Portland to speed their trip home to Deering, Maine, all on board. Charles Thomas Thompson, his wife um, and daughter were also traveling with him. He was 34 years old and head of a firm of C.H. Thompson and Company, which was a grocery firm. And Miss Cobb, who in the newspaper the next day was reported that at the first parish where Miss Cobb was a member of the choir, Reverend um, Perkins, before his sermon, read a carefully prepared tribute to her and spoke the words of sympathy to all who suffered from the disaster. She was on her way back home to sing in the choir the next day, which never occurred. Among the passengers, there were 64 members. Nearly half were African Americans. Many attended the Abyssinian Meeting House, which is today the third oldest African American meeting house in the United States, a historical landmark. The devastating effects on the African American community rippled through time. Some were immediate. Um, it was stated in the same paper that last evening, the Reverend T.A. Smith, pastor of the Abyssinian Church, preacher, preached a powerful descriptive memorial sermon of the recent distressful disaster that befell a great number, number of constant worshipers at the church, that they were missed in person, but still remained within, within the enclosure of the sacred edifice was well pictured in words of simple meaning to fit the occasion. Those who had the opportunity of being present and had the pleasure of, pleasure of knowing the absent alluded to will not soon forget. The pastor's comparison of the beautiful work of God, the indirect illusion of those who perished brought out those nearer to them into tears and but few at times could be seen with dry eyes. The singing was effective and well chosen. The close of the sermon was delivered with a will sent forth from living to those noble heroes who perished while in the just discharge of their duty. These were the people that the passengers turned to. Over the last two years, we've seen the important role of the essential worker, the one that might be taken for granted, the ones that are there to serve, but to be in the background. And yet when disasters strike, those that are relied on the most. And so she was lost for over a hundred years for nearly a hundred years, people searched for her, wondered where she went. There was rumors about locations and mystery ships and ghost ships, and perhaps she was heard a few miles here or a few miles there off the coast. But it wasn't until nearly a hundred years later in the late 1980s, the two gentlemen on your left-hand side of the screen, uh, John Fish and Arnie Carr, 
who um, were shipwreck enthusiasts, both in diving and also in advanced technology of remote sensing, where they would send underwater cameras and robots called ROVs, remote operating vehicles, down to and side scan sonar, um, looking for Portland, among other sites along the way. Well, we had a wonderful interview with both of them. This is a screen grab from a recounting uh, how they eventually located the possible site of the Portland. And it came through the partnership of Woods Hole and an oceanographer named Richard Lineburner, who looked at the historical records where the bodies were recovered. And based on that detail that I mentioned just a few minutes ago about the wristwatch uh, found in certain pockets or washed up on the shore, many of them came with the time 9.30. And so of course there's no AM or PM on a pocket watch. So he had to work with those two hypotheses and reverse engineering the ocean currents. He found two possible locations, one based on the 9.30 PM time and one at 9.30 AM. And with that new information, John and Arnie went out and began new search. And within relatively a short time, they found something. But the state of technology at the time, the late 80s, didn't allow them to um, officially confirm that this is, was indeed the Portland. Instead, they had a good idea that it was, but had to wait till later. In the meantime, 1992, uh, the um, National Marine Sanctuary Stowag and Bank uh, was established and became the protectorate for all resources, both natural and cultural within its boundaries. And so over time, uh, Benjamin Haskell, now the uh, deputy superintendent of the, uh, of the sanctuary was on the phone with Arnie talking to them about how great it would be to go out with the new technology and discover or rediscover or identify the uh, shipwreck Portland. And through their cooperation, they went back. And in 2000, 2001, they were able to find the site and confirm based on the smokestacks, the shape and the better technology uh, that it indeed was the location uh, a few hours into the park, into the park. It's like a national park, but a sanctuary, into the sanctuary um, that the Portland had been found. And in the subsequent years, um, archeologists Matt Lawrence and Dee Dee Marks uh, worked a lot to start to uncover and document uh, what had happened to the shipwreck since it sank in 1898. And so for nearly, from 2001 through 2010, nearly every year there was an expedition to go out and to look at the site um, in various ways. The images that you have on the right-hand side are side scan sonar images. These images are produced by sound waves being um, pinged through the water column through a, a, from a piece of equipment called a towfish. It looks like a torpedo with fins. That's why it's called a towfish. And it, sings, it sends out, much like a radar location, um, but sound waves that go down to the bottom and then ping back or reflect back up to the computer and the sensor, and the algorithm is converted into an image. Sometimes the images uh, are nice and, and beautiful, such as uh, a couple of these, and other times the waves and the motion of the boat will affect the look of that. So working out on the water is always a challenge. But each year they came back and wonderful things about this is you can see it sitting here at the bottom and the shadow shows you kind of the um, silhouette, ghostly silhouette of the deck and the frames and the walking beam still present um, during this expedition. And so, as I said, some of these expeditions also were out to document the site and look at the artifacts. In 2004 and 2005, they, part, uh, NOAA participated in what was known as a photo mosaic project where you take photographs of as much of the ship as you can and then you stitch it together like a jigsaw puzzle. This is the photo mosaic. And what you see is the areas they recovered. They were able to get 
to uh, the port side bow area of the vessel and produce these images. You can see actually the individual photographs kind of stitched together along this line. They were unable to get all the way around due to the nets and the uh, underwater vehicle they were using was very large. It's uh, again called an ROV, a remote operating vehicle. And basically it's underwater drone, but instead of flying it, it has to be attached back to the boat. And the vessel, the shipwreck sits in 500 feet of water. So you have over 500 feet of tether or umbilical going down to this underwater robot and it's dark and there's currents and the only light you can see are the large flashlights or headlights on the, on the vehicle itself. And then when you get down there, you see all of these fishing nets and areas where you can get this very expensive, very large uh, underwater drone caught. And you can imagine the pilot saying, I'm not gonna get any closer. We're not gonna risk it. We're gonna do the best we can. And they were able to get these photographs uh, in this project and stitch it together and give us our first glimpse in over a uh, hundred years of what the Portland actually looked like um, and how she's resting during this period. In 2010 and 2011, in that time frame, the last documentation project um, occurred on the Portland as well as other shipwrecks. In 2019 and 2020, we received funding um, to go back out and document. And what I have right now is one of the videos that we put together to introduce our project to those who were tuning in for our live broadcast. And I'd like to share it with you. It's dynamic, it's very well produced. We had a wonderful team who were working with us. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the details when we finally went out there. Eight hundred forty-two square miles, up to six hundred feet deep. The final resting place of hundreds of shipwrecks, and one of the top ten whale watching destinations in the world. Located twenty-five miles off Boston, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is home to a rich assortment of marine life, including Atlantic cod, haddock, flounder, bluefin tuna and many species of whales, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Stellwagen Bank also contains vast numbers of shipwrecks, ranging from wooden sailing ships to modern fishing trawlers. These wrecks are both windows into the past and important habitats for marine life. Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary is one of 16 marine protected areas within the National Marine Sanctuary System, a network of more than 600,000 square miles of underwater parks. Managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the sanctuaries promote responsible, sustainable use of ocean and Great Lakes resources. To foster the public's connection with the ocean, NOAA awarded funding to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution often referred to as HUI, to conduct state-of-the-art research. Based on nearby Cape Cod, HUI is the world's oldest and largest nonprofit ocean research and education institution. In 2019, tools and technologies pioneered by HUI and their partner, Marine Imaging Technologies, let us share high-resolution images and interact with viewers in real time. This year, those same remote tools allow us to carry on our work during the pandemic. In early March, we added innovative microwave technology that beams data to shore, providing faster communication and better images. And we adapted our research model to include a smaller crew at sea and broad distribution to partners on land. COVID-19 has changed many aspects of our lives. But with careful preparation, social distancing, and technology, we can safely continue researching the ocean floor and sharing our discoveries in real time with you.
142 square miles. So this project, as mentioned in the video, was a two-year interdisciplinary project taking together biology, archaeology, engineering, and deep sea exploration funded through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Ocean Service and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries to explore, survey, and then provide outreach through this concept of telepresence um, of the biological and cultural sites within the sanctuary. Telepresence uh, is an opportunity to bring students and people from around the world, uh, from, in, from classrooms to institutions to just the general public into the science field and actually provide real-time information to them um, as we're doing our expedition and our projects and answer questions of those who might be interested. So comparison, this was the, the yellow shows the area covered in 2000, 2005 uh, photo mosaic expedition. And our goal in 2019 and 20 was to finish it, to basically achieve as much as possible 100% coverage and create a full reconstruction model, uh, 3D model that would stitch together photographs and provide a virtual tour of what the shipwreck looks like today. So it was ambitious. And of course, it wasn't just this shipwreck, we had other sites to look at as well. So uh, this was not done just through Woods Hole. It was a partnership primarily with Marine Imaging Technologies, Stellwagen and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, uh, Ro University of Rhode Island's Inner Space Center, University of Connecticut's uh, research ve vessel, the Connecticut, as well as the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And uh, we worked with a, a group um, called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants uh, that connected us to schools all across the country through YouTube and virtual webinars like this one, but in a very kind of fun and interactive uh, model that we were able to talk to school kids from all over the country and uh, and it was quite it was some of the funnest experiences to see them and some of their questions and well, many of them simply just wanted to be on camera because they were up, uh, uh, on camera in real time so uh, that was quite quite a wonderful collaboration um, 2019 had both a very small operation footprint where you can see uh, this was our research vessel, uh, just over, you know, about 40 feet. And this is not a huge uh, research vessel, such as you might think of the Calypso or, uh, you know, Nautica or something like that aspect of it. It was us all crammed right in the front right here, looking at very small screens. This is Dr. Uh, uh, Kaiser, Meyer Kaiser, who is the biologist, and uh, she's happy in this picture, but you can imagine if you're looking at this little tiny monitor for hours as the boat is rolling back and forth, there was moments of seasickness for sure. Uh, this is our wonderful engineering team, Captain Dave, Evan Kovacs, uh, CEO of Marine Imaging Technology, and Dave, our pilot, who I can call them, I just call them Han Solo because he could take our little ROV right here, Pixel, who was designed to actually look like a character such as Wally -E or uh, you know a robot because part of our mission was um, outreach and we wanted to engage school kids. So when they designed this ROV, they made a very small. It sits on a um, on a table that's not well. It's, you can see it right there. It's it's basically a um, size of a, a folding table and can be deployed by a very small team which cuts down on costs, but in small packages come big products. And Marine Imaging Technology put into this little guy, this ROV Pixel, um, some first-class equipment, high-definition cameras that could record in cinema class, uh, underwater imaging, lots of light, 40,000 lumens of dimmable lighting. It's just very bright. That's what I usually called it. Um, and capable of carrying several cameras for all types of virtual modeling that we were doing. And as I was saying, Dave, our ROV pilot, was able to get this little guy into places where I didn't think was possible. And because our pixel was smaller, we were able to move, maneuver it um, much faster and to move it into areas that the larger ROVs wouldn't go because of the risk of entanglement to them. 
but we had the advantage of size. And so over 2019, we covered the rest of the starboard, uh, rest of the port side of the Portland, and as much as we could of the um, other side as well, but there were still gaps and there's quite a bit of lessons learned. Portland is an extraordinarily challenging site. Anything that is at that depth, um, when you're working with a small team, there was a sharp learning curve, but we still were able to produce results, get some um, baseline information. This is what the bow currently looks like based on our pictures. This isn't one photograph. This is several hundred stitched together to give us this image. And that's part of the photo mosaic. You can see the difference of quality almost immediately from what I showed you before. This looks like a photograph. It has that high quality imaging. And that's because Pixel had these cameras. You can also see um, a, you know, a fishing gear and net strewn all about. And because of these images, we were able to take a look at the low quality or uh, images from 2006 that they worked on and just do visual impacts and comparisons in 2019. And you can see there was life, sponges and enemies all working down. This is the bow section, but in 2019, those had all been scraped off uh, from this net, this trawl net that had appeared somewhere in between. Now, when did it appear? We don't know. We just know in between the, the 2006 photo and this one that this um, had been intrusive and had affected the site to some degree. Again, some of our uh, this, some of our interpretations had to be qualified based on just we were looking at things visually. We weren't able to take full measurements. We had these side scan sonars that showed the ship in a beautiful, what's called a um, fantail transom. It goes around the semicircle, this ellipsis. And these are really graceful um, ends to a, to a vessel at the stern. Well, when we went back in 2019, we were looking for this graceful shape, this beautiful arc that would be at the tailor end where you could see people standing and we couldn't find it. Um, and what we found in these pictures as we were looking is that at some point this had been sheared off and it was gone. So with this information after 2019, we regrouped and went back with new questions in 2020. But as I mentioned before we left, we had an opportunity to work with and talk to students about what we were doing. And this was broadcast from the RV Connecticut. Um, we started on site and then uh, remnants of a storm pushed us off for the last couple of days. And, and it was unfortunate that we weren't able to get our ROV in asking, talking to the students, but it did allow us to, um, to create some programs and actually kind of make a, a, a curriculum on the fly that we were able to talk to students over the last couple of days. And so over that project, you can see the impact that we had. We were able to connect to over 1400 students in Massachusetts, Texas, Michigan, California, um, an impact of 9,400 people uh, or more online. And we were very happy with this first run. Uh, and this is our RV Connecticut team, a great group of people all around that was very successful. But as I said, there were gaps and there was quite a bit that we learned. So over that winter of 2019 and 2020, we um, adjusted and then we readjusted because something happened, of course, 2020 that none of us could predict or expected, and that was COVID. And for a while, we weren't sure we were able to do our project going back and forth in the late summer, based on several guidelines and safety procedures, we were allowed with a very, very small team with about three of us to go back out and finish what we started. And um, we use new technology to broadcast, not from a large vessel, but from RV Connecticut, but smaller vessels uh, that we were working on in real time. And based on the information that we learned in 2019, we also built a brand new robot, a new ROV that could go into, into places that Pixel could not. 
so this is a video. Deep sea research and exploration are completely dependent on technology to go where humans can't. At Stellwagen Bank, we use a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, named Pixel to take pictures and video around shipwrecks. Pixel is relatively small, a fraction the size of deep sea ROVs. But sometimes we need something even smaller to advance our scientific goals, a penetration vehicle. This year, Marine Imaging Technologies built one, the Portland Penetration Explorer, or PPE, designed to go inside shipwrecks. PPE hitches a ride to the wreck on Pixel, then flies off and explores places even Pixel can't go. Looking inside the Portland helps us gather more information about her final moments. PPE's wide-angle, low-light 4K camera captures images from deep inside, where light is often scarce. These same images will let us build a future VR experience based around the Portland. One of our biggest technological changes this year is not underwater, but in air. Telepresence typically involves broadcasting via satellite, or VSAT. But VSAT equipment is large, heavy, costly, and poorly suited to small vessels. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're operating with a reduced crew on a much smaller boat, the Catapult. We needed a solution that provided real-time communication to partners on land, but that Catapult could still fit and operate. So we partnered with AV Watch, who provide high bandwidth communications for the US Coast Guard, Air Force, and Navy. They pioneered a new way of using microwave broadcast technology, pairing small, stabilized transmitters at sea with equally small receivers on land, or even on a plane. Their technologies provide high bandwidth data at a fraction of VSAT's cost, letting us send multiple real-time video feeds to our team ashore and helping everyone stay safe. So these are just some pictures that of, um, this is Pixel actually holding uh, the ROV PPE that we nicknamed Taz because it sounded like the Tasmanian devil um, when we put it in the water and um, keeping track of time. But I'd like to show something very special with you right now. This is uh, Taz PPE leaving the docking station of Pixel. This is looking back in. And I'd like to take you on a journey um, into the Portland, not to the outside, but we're actually going down inside the lower decks uh, as best as we can. And you will see um, sites that most will never see that few have seen in over 123 years as Portland sits um, today, uh, recorded in the fall of 2020. So, No sound with this, so you don't have to adjust the um, audio. No. But those lasers that you saw on Pixel gives us scale. Where, uh, wherever they land, they're uh, measured and calibrated so we know how far apart they are and we can use it to establish scale. We're going now to the, um, to the hold. Uh, it's covered in sediment. It's very confusing. Taz looks, is going in, we see pipes. Uh, vents, uh, valves right here. These are large intakes that would run up to the engineering section. We're near the um, center of the vessel where the walking beam and the engines are. In fact, you can see these ghostly images of the work. Um, pause right there. Uh, decorative filigree falling down to the bottom. Valve here. You would spin the wheel to relieve pressure or to, to increase pressure. Lots of particulate, lots of current. As we look at this, you're wondering what you're looking at sometimes. Uh, of course, life and um, exists everywhere. 
uh, many fish made at their home. This beautiful bronze uh, platform for potentially a, um, a sconce or a light, just sitting quiet, hundreds of years of particulate and sediment building up over time really restricted our movement. We also, when we were down below decks, it was an overhead environment. So we were very cautious. We moved extraordinarily slow and it was the first time anyone had been below deck. If you're looking at the back of one of the boilers that would have powered a 355 nominal horsepower um, walking beam. And it was really powerful and really a privilege to have this opportunity. Um, we're not sure what this leather um, uh, artifact is, whether it was connected to a shoe or some other um, part of that, but it is a reminder that people were on board. And this is an area of tragedy. And because of our work, we were able to take a tour and start to understand the site working from the bow. And we can see more nets and trawl nets uh, draped across the bow. One of their kedge anchors hidden within the net. This is where Pixel got down actually close to the net and peeked underneath of it in an area that where it was kind of floating up. I was just amazed. This, um, paddle wheels their uh, rims, all three of them, the spokes, areas like the walking beam, the stands 30 feet high, and this is thousands of photographs put together. But if you compare it to schematics, such as from illustrations and books, here's a six foot gentleman, you can actually see the pieces as they stand in situ or in place. And this is amazing. We know that whatever happened, she came to rest softly that it still stands, uh, almost an Eiffel Tower to, to industry um, and the shipwreck. And putting all this together, we are currently creating a new photo mosaic. Um, even today, it's still, it's quite a process to, con to take hours and thousands of videos and compress them. And so this is an incomplete model, but the difference between where we started in 2004 and where we're going today should be uh, readily uh, visible. We can take a tour as we move into the 2019 image of the bow. We see the net, the capstan, there's a hawse hole there. And we spin around and are now looking at the starboard side. We fill in this gap, there's the net. We work our way down. And each step we can see new information, new details, new trauma, as I like to call it. Breaking of where the side wheels were. And we zoom in, there's a little red fish down in the lower right hand corner and we see bowls, cups. As we go closer, we'll actually see plates. All this is wonderful for education and outreach as we can explain to students what happened. But if, as an archeologist, we have a chance to do a virtual excavation and understand those last moments. I get asked a lot, what is one of my favorite parts on the vessel? And it's this area. I'm gonna explain. A, coming to the end here and the connection between the shipwreck 500 feet below the surface to today starts for me well, all over the wreck actually but here is where it becomes very powerful if you look you'll see plates and kind of a warming oven a warming stove similar to what you would find at a buffet at a hotel today but where is it where does it sit well when we look at the schematics you will see an area that says basically the washroom. And next to the washroom is a very large timber right here. When we were going around with Pixel, we found this area and you can see toilet bowl, washing basins, washing 
uh, ceramics and actual faucet handles right here. And we had found that area depicted on, on the schematic. Then we found a keystone, a way to tie what was on the ground, this was on the surf on the bottom, and what was up on the wreck. And it was this long timber that goes from the bottom and comes up right down here. It's the same timber here and here. This locked the decking above the surface to the bottom of the surface right around the wash room. And what we see is that this is right next to the ladies lounge or the ladies saloon. So this is the area where the women can go and be with the, by themselves and talk amongst themselves freely without the intrusion of men. They could get the food that would be brought back from the galley and warmed up on these heat or kept warm on the heating stoves and have their own space aboard. This is an area where women like Miss Cobb, Susan and her daughter Gladys, Miss Thompson with her family who just came from the Netherlands that I showed you earlier, excuse me, Miss Schmidt. And Miss Eunice Wheeler who was traveling with her sister could all come and talk and they would be taken care of by Miss Harris who was a woman steward. And perhaps they were sitting here before tragedy struck. Shipwrecks aren't about the ships themselves. They were places where members of different social classes could come and mingle. They were transitional, they were recreational, and for 12 hours, they were the home to groups of people that wouldn't have met in any other way. There were also where work was done, where crews sat and tended on those passengers to make them feel most comfortable and special. And in doing so, make the noise, the smoke, and the sounds of a 290 foot ship with a 30 foot walking beam and massive boilers, coal and the stink and the fire disappear into a revelry of pleasant travel. And there were sites of tragedy. But unlike sites of tragedy on land, you cannot visit them. There is no place that is visible where the ship sinks and yet it is no less tragic to the community. This is Fran Silcock. Her great grandmother lost her husband on board the Portland. And I'd like to share with you, if you indulge me, I know we're getting close to the end. I just need to do a little transition. I had the opportunity through the graceful um, courtesy and host of Portland Greater Landmarks as well as Herb Adams and um, his efforts to come up several times to Portland and to interview various people. And it was here where the power of the sinking and the connection to Portland um, comes through. Um, I tell you what, and, and looking just here, I'm gonna come back to her because I have to shift screens and I'm afraid I'm gonna lose uh, my PowerPoint, but I'm, she tells this wonderful story about her grandmother not able to hear the bells or the harbor horn because those were the bells of death. And there was a chest where she kept a newspaper clipping. That was the only thing she had. And every now and then Fran as a little girl would be allowed to see it. And she tells just the most beautiful touching um, story of that memory. So uh, when I get through the end, I wanna come back and I wanna share that with you. Uh, it is what archeology span should be. It's using the past to connect to the present and the living memory. One gentleman that 
I just enjoyed interviewing over and over again was Mr. Bob Green, who has um, quite the collective uh, anecdote and um, and uh, uh, stories about Portland growing up there and his experiences, as well as his own connection to uh, the second steward of the Portland, even Houston, and even um, was related to Bob via a second marriage. Um, Bob's um, great grandmother was the second marriage to even Houston, whose first marriage, his wife had died the previous, uh, no, it was her second marriage. I got to get that right within my notes. Um, she had married even after losing her, her first husband the year before, and even went on to the Portland <laughs> never to return. Newspaper reports had her aboard with her husband even, but fortunately for me and for everybody, uh, because Mr. Green was a descendant, um, she was safe on shore. Unfortunately, um, even Houston was on board and he likely was there providing comfort and solace to those who couldn't find it anywhere else because that was his duty. That was his job to take care of the passengers as best he could for that journey. And um, maybe most of that time was simply to be working around the edges, called upon, but in moments of crisis, as I mentioned before, you turn to those you probably take most for, for granted. They become the heroes um, in those last moments. And so, um, as I said, I've spoken with Mr. Green uh, and Mr. Adams uh, several times. And I'm very grateful for the wisdom they've imparted. And it's much more than I can, I can share right here. Um, there's so many wonderful stories. And one of them actually came from uh, Mr. Green. I was noticing uh, this model of the Portland when, during one of our broadcasts. And I noticed at the very bottom, or at the top, excuse me, of the uh, the paddle wheel guard right here, there was a curious emblem. It was hard to make out on the model because of the scale, but I found pictures and I noticed it was accurate on the model. There was a picture there. And this would have been the area of the ship uh, uh, with the side wheels. So I was interested. So I looked it up and, oh, this is actually what this part looks like underwater now. And it was hard to figure out, and then I realized it was a bird. And what I thought was fire coming from out, but I looked at the Portland's um, uh, seal, and it, they weren't flames, but two dolphins. Um, but you can see the motto. Um, the seal contains a shield bearing a ship supported by two dolphins. The shield is set on top of an anchor and a bird. Uh, which is supposed to represent a phoenix. And the motto is resurgam, means arise. And I found this very powerful. And when I was talking to Mr. Green, he talked about a class ring that he designed with three flames based on the three fires in Portland's history, most famous, of course, with the 1866 fire. And it was very fitting and touching that this notion of rising from the ashes, but to mix the metaphor, rising from the deep came to symbolize what we were doing with the Portland. Symbolically and virtually, we're raising the ship uh, through our 3D modeling for archaeological scientific research, but also to give back, to connect to people around not just the sanctuary, not just Massachusetts or New England, but around the country on the importance of maritime heritage. And in doing that, the people on board the ship weren't, weren't just working there. They were passengers. They had lives in Portland or in Boston, and therefore their stories rippled through time and their connections rippled through time, through the today's city's landscape, through historical landmarks, um, such as the Abyssinian House, but as well as through those people who remember them. And in giving these talks, people have come and told me some of their connections. And for me, that living memory and living history is some of the most powerful aspects of what I do. So I'd like to thank all of you who joined today. Uh, 
I really, there's so much more to talk about. You have over 200 stories on board this vessel, not to mention uh, where it starts and where it ends. Uh, everybody that helped um, the Maine Historical Society, um, Bob Green, Herb Adams, the Greater uh, Portland Landmarks, uh, have all been immensely helpful and, and continue to be as we go through. I'm always hoping to get back to research. Uh, life gets in the way, um, paying the bills gets in the way, but the story endures and I am just humble and grateful to be participating as I can be. And so I thank you for all your time. And um, I don't know if we have a little bit more to show that video. I'll leave it to you, Kathleen. Um, it's about two or three minutes of Fran. Of sure. Fran. I'd like to get to a couple of questions from the audience first, um, but then I think we have time to squeeze that in um, okay. for those of you that can stick with us. And of course, if, if you need to leave um, as we approach eight o'clock, this program is being recorded and will be shared on our website, uh, mainhistory.org. So you can always check out the rest of it later. Um, someone is asking, what were the most important things that you learned from examining the wreck? Um, this is going to sound, we really went in with baseline characterization, meaning we didn't know what we were going to find. Um, some of the things that jumped out, archaeologically speaking, is uh, both the level of preservation of the engine area and the boiler. Um, sometimes when a shipwreck um, happens, the boiler explodes and there's traumatic issues, but it's in wonderful preservation um, from that stuff from that aspect. On the other hand, um, the timber elements like the decking or like I said, the back, the stern, we noticed that there had been some um, pretty major impact from cultural processes. That's archeology span for speak from in li all likelihood fishing activities, um, accidental most likely, but still those 10 years we noticed um, uh, there was quite a bit of degradation to the wooden elements. So that means the decking frames and, and particularly the stern of the fantail. So we, we, what, the most important aspect is that um, Stellwagen Marine Sanctuary has a, um, a very uh, important, significant non-renewable resource in the sense that you can't replicate the ship, that it has to actively monitor and evidence showing that. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that based on like watches that were discovered, um, trying to figure out what time it sank and using that information to help determine exactly where it sank. A couple of people have asked, are asking, did they ever determine was that 9.30 a.m. or p.m.? My apologies if I didn't say that. It's 9.30 a.m. And, the, and they did determine that because... Um, as I said, the oceanographer calculated two trajectories, one on the PM and one on the AM. And I apologize. It was uh, the one that won that race was the 930 AM. That's where they found it based on that calculation. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, thank you. Where, do we know where the nets came from? And is there, are there, will they ever be removed or are they just, they're there? Um, well, we know of uh, fishing trawlers, but we don't know, you know, who that is. Can't be more specific, happened. yeah. Right, yeah. We know it happened in between 2010 and 2019 for the new sites. We would love to remove them. In fact, that's always kind of um, uh, that discussion is what would be an innovative way to remove them? Right now, it's safer not to remove them. Uh, it's in 500 feet and you cut lines that have um, you know floats attached to them so it's not that just they, they would drop but even mm -hmm. if they did you wouldn't know so it's kind of you know when you have that risk of you know staying with what you know rather than reintroducing um, uh, new variables to it but uh, you know we're always thinking wouldn't it be great if we could remove those nets but how do you do that safely sure right now we're gonna leave them um are there any plans for artifacts to be brought up from the ship? No, uh, there are not, not that it wouldn't be um, really interesting to have it, but again, um, right now, the best thing to do is leave things in place. Uh, once you start moving, 
mm -hmm. artifacts, you don't know if you're going to introduce um, a variable that causes more damage to the wreck. Uh, but one of the great things about the photo, uh, the 3D virtual model is it allow us to virtually look at things and then you know, you can make an educated decision if there's an artifact that um, would a give us information or b has some significance to um, to the public or research question. But for right now, the best practice is leave inputs. Um, couple other questions. Um, do you know if the Portland, did it have any other ports where it stopped? Portland, New York, Boston, are those the only ones? Yeah, it was it was a night boat specifically for Portland and Boston, but for sure there were different lines and different, this industry of the night boat where it would, um, you saw on the map, there was, a, there was a picture of the different ports up into Maine. Um, the original owner was the Portland Steamship Company, which their line primarily was Portland to Boston. Uh, there, on the South Shore, there was a Fall River line that ran from Fall River down to New York, but they were competitors. Eventually, uh, the Portland Steamship Company becomes an Eastern Steamship Company, and they had a a a, um, a night boat that did run down to New York later, much um, ten to twenty years later. A couple of people are asking too again about like those nets. Um, that site off limits like now to dragging to fishing to prevent stuff like that from happening again or well actually stowing and bank it, it, fishing is um fishing is allowed it is an open access for fishing there are um, areas you know uh you know natural resources like the right whales are protected but mm -hmm. one of one of the challenge for management there is the fact that you can you allow fishing um, mm -hmm. and these nets um you know, are um, probably accidentally get hung up. Uh, and so they are looking at ways to um, mitigate that situation, not just for the Portland, um, but also the other, right now there's 47 documented shipwrecks in Stellwagen Bank, but there's possibly over 200 wow. uh, wow. at different places. So um, in the 800, it's nearly a thousand square acres and um, one of our goals is to start mapping it and get a better understanding from the cultural um, cultural resource side of it so you know where the ship's located but is that location specifically a secret to help protect the site that's exactly right yeah uh, they have uh, for most of their sites they have non-disclosure um, policy so and even I, I would only know it by the GPS. <laughs> I purposely, you know, don't, you can't be in trouble if you don't know everything. So the captain takes me where to where you go. But Very nice. overall, most of their sites are not, are not disclosed for that. Sure. Research. Do we know anything more about how the ship actually sank? A couple of people are asking, swamped. Um, I mean, I imagine a lot of that's probably shrouded in mystery, but. What do, what well, do you think? that is the million dollar question. Yeah. That is um, that is the one that is like at the top of the list. What actually happened that night? We don't have clear def definitive answers to that because science is frustrating that way. Uh, but we know that there wasn't a major traumatic event. When I say traumatic, what I mean an explosion or a boiler right, right. or salt getting in there blowing that up because they're intact. Mm -hmm. uh, there are parts of um, the engine area that looks like they have come apart. Now, like just like with a, an axle on a car, is that what caused it? Or is that a secondary effect of something else causing it? And then mm -hmm. that happened afterwards. One of the reasons we wanted to go into the wreck with Taz was that no one had seen the boilers. No one had seen underneath there. And one of the areas that we just couldn't get to because of sediment buildup and also for safety and we were just being very conservative of where we went was the coal bunkers. Maybe they ran out of fuel. Mm. Uh, they started at 7 p.m. They were expected to arrive at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. in Portland. And we know that they sank based on the, uh, the pocket watches at 9.30 a.m. And they were fighting a vicious storm. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to take a look sure. at the coal, <laughs> coal areas because they might have gone and consumed a fuel or possibly again it was a mechanical break and the end the, the walking beam stopped uh, i feel comfortable though that it wasn't a major 
uh, there wasn't a large explosion that right. rocked the ship and it came down um, very gently. So we've at least one person in the audience who has a personal connection. I'm going to guess there are more because I know whenever we do a program on this topic, it, yeah. it brings out a lot of people in the community that and have and a I'd family like story. Yes. Just, just on that, if anybody, if anybody wants, I in in the in in the um, need of uh, talking to more people. So uh, if you have connections, if they can reach out to the Maine Historical Society, I'd love to hear these stories. Absolutely. So, so my email is k n e u m a n n at mainhistory.org. If uh, you guys reach out to me. Um, because you have a story you want to share, or even if you have a question that we just don't have time to get to tonight, I'm happy to forward those on to Calvin. So this person is asking, um, do we know, did Captain Blanchard have the reputation of being very prompt? The reason I ask is because my great grandmother just missed boarding the ship because she was delayed traveling um, on tro by trolley to Boston during the buildup of the storm. That's, oh, that's... That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy for, for her. Um, he, um, his reputation, I will say this, suffered because of this. There were, of course, lots of scapegoating. Um, mm -hmm. He knew the storm was coming. I think that, to me, my the hypothesis I'm working with, similarly as an air, airplane um, pilot would, knowing a storm's coming, that in this case, uh, he would leave as soon as he could. So very promptly in this case, as far as his reputation on being prompt, um, I'm, I'm not, maybe somebody out there has a better sense of that, I'm not sure. But I think um, as I kind of tell people, when you're on sitting on the plane and the pilot says, we're gonna get going to try to beat the storm, passengers will often be thankful for that. And right. I, I try not to read into the conspiracy notions and there's several of them out there, but- um, I didn't even I think to, to check, but I know when we were planning this program, I was hopeful, oh, we'll do it in November. I'll do it on the anniversary, which is just a little too close to Thanksgiving. Did the holiday have any influence? Do you think, like, do we know when Thanksgiving fell in 1898? That had nothing yeah, to do it, with it. Yeah, it was that Thursday before, so it was the 24th. Okay, okay. And it was the 24th. Um, no, I, I, you know, I don't think so. Um, some say he needed to get home for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I, uh, others, you know, there were, there were, um, there was going to be another tele, telegraph or another update at around 9 p.m., and many cautioned him to wait till then. Yeah. Um, but no one knows for sure. Uh, yeah, it's just the motivations. I kind of just keep, you know, benefit of the doubt that he had about 200 people on board who wanted to get home after a long yeah. break. And um, maybe he had his own personal motivations, but uh, it's a large, it's a big risk. But I, I just think yeah. it took him by surprise. It, it, yeah. You know, he knew it was coming and tried to get ahead of it. I'm going to take one more question and then you can, uh, if you'd like to show that additional video, that would be a great way to end. Sure. Um, how long do you think it will take to complete the imaging for a full virtual tour of the ship? That is uh, the, um, you can do anything with enough money and enough time. And that's really, we were supposed to have three years of the project and that third year was post-processing. Um, that was cut. Uh, but we have had great support from the administration at the National Marine Sanctuary to do whatever they can to um, to complete that. And, and currently, some uh, funding has been um, has allowed the team. Now, you know, it kind of goes to wizards, as what I kind of call them, the know how to compile this accurately and create the virtual tour. Uh, and so we're hoping uh, within the next, uh, you know, I'm not sure the time frame, but by spring, we'll have them as complete a model as um, as possible on the data that we have. We've also applied through to the National Endowment of Humanities to actually create a prototype of that virtual um, tour, kind of what we're calling the underwater museum. Great. We'll hear about that in the spring too. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. Um, My and uh, folks, if you uh, want to learn more, um, again, don't hesitate to email me at K-N-E-U-M-A-N-N -N 
at mainhistory.org if you have uh, more questions for Calvin or stories that you would like to share. And be sure to visit mainhistory.org to see the recording of this and all of our other virtual programs and to learn more about how you can visit Maine Historical Society, uh, become a member, do research in our library. You can find that all on our website. Is there anything you'd like to say, uh, Calvin, before you share that uh, last uh, video with us? Uh, just my heartfelt thanks to you, Kathleen, the Maine Historical Society, um, all of those that have opened up um, their hospitality and their efforts to help in the research. I have found Portland, it, it, its charm has definitely um, uh, washed over me and I can't wait to get back up there um, and do more of this. The story it can go in several different directions and I just, I know I didn't say thank you to everybody, but I really, I want you to know I really appreciate it of, of everything that's been done and, um, and so thank you if you're out there. Thank you. All right, so um, this is a, about two or three minutes and it's from Fran um, talking about uh, her memories of her grandmother. My grandmother found it difficult to talk about it. It was not talked about a lot, but occasionally we would, if I was be alone with her often, and I would ask her something, tell me, Nana, about the Portland. She would tell me a few things, and uh, she did not know a lot either because of the communication at that time. They didn't know for several days whether the ship was lost or was just off course or what. And during that time, my, my grandmother would go when she could. She was living in Portland at the time with my family. Uh, she would go down to the wharves where people were gathering, people who had people who were on the Portland to try to get some information. And... Um, the foghorns blew incessantly, and as a result, even many years later, when I was growing up, she couldn't stand to hear the foghorns because they were to her the, the, the horns of death. If anything, I would like to find my cousin someday when I have time. And see, she still has Nana's trunk, and I to get in that trunk. We were never allowed to touch it. Once in a while, my grandmother would open it. Yeah, she would open it. Did she ever show anybody? She, she would take out the, the paper, oh, the that. newspaper, yes. And the last I knew that was still in there. And there were other things in there that belonged to her. I don't know if they pertain to the Portland or not. I don't remember what was in there. Did anybody ever get in trouble for going too close to Nana's trunk? As kids sometimes do. No, no. Making you Everybody knew to stay away from That was Nana's place. trunk, and you didn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she would be very... I don't know the best term, perhaps wistful, uh, sad somewhat, but then she would get over it very quickly. She would explain to us a little, a little bit about it, about the, the sinking, and then put the paper back in the trunk, and that was it. Say, we're going to have dinner in half an hour. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Calvin, again, this was great. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us and uh, I hope we'll see everybody back here real soon.